I made a treasure hunt where players need to solve the cryptic clues given in this book, discover the locations and follow a path to the hidden treasure. Let's go find some treasure. Now the book has an e-paper display. When you turn it on you'll see the title screen and then you're presented with a clue to the first location, which is a riddle along with a drawing at the bottom. Now you can make these clues as cryptic as you want. If you were doing an easter egg hunt for kids you'd probably want to be pretty explicit about the exact location. But if you're more inspired by the large scale treasure hunts like Masquerade or Forest Fen, you can be a lot more cryptic. And I could include a whole montage sequence here of me exploring with my dog, but that's not the point of this video. I created this hunt so I know exactly where I'm heading for, which is the tree in front of me, where one of the branches has bent right over and planted itself back in the ground, creating this arch. So that fits the description in the riddle. But what I need to do is to stand in the exact spot that matches the depiction in the image. When I do that, you'll see I get the next clue displayed. So we'll set off once more. Now over this gully you'll see a pool of water and there's a fallen tree lying across it. The clue says to step with care, so I'm going to walk across the tree to cross over to the other side. And as they reach the bank you'll see the clue changes again. So I think you get the idea, you carry on following the clues from each location to the next until you reach the treasure at the end of the hunt. So how does this all work? Well, you might think it uses GPS positioning and that I've programmed the coordinates of each clue location like in geocaching, but that's not actually the case. At each location I've placed one of these BLE beacons. So this is a low power Bluetooth transmitter. It's in a waterproof plastic shell about 4 centimetres across and a centimetre high, weighs about 20 grams, and it can run on a coin cell battery for a couple of years. And all it does is continuously broadcasts a unique ID. Now inside the book I've got an ESP32 which has been programmed with the IDs of the beacons at each location, together with the clue text and images. It uses the ESP32's built-in Bluetooth to continuously scan for nearby devices, and if any of them match one of the predefined beacon IDs, it displays the clue and image associated with it on the e-paper display. E-paper displays run at 3.3 volts and they require very little power. In fact, they only draw any current at all when the display is changed. So I can disconnect the battery completely and the image and clue text will stay there. And you can run this whole setup on a single rechargeable LiPo battery and it will keep going all day. Now you might think this all sounds a bit over-engineered. Why make a treasure hunt using all this electronics and technology when you could just put written clues at each location? Well, the main benefit of this approach is that there's no way for players to shortcut to the solution. They only receive one clue at a time and the book will only advance when they arrive at the next location. So they have to follow the whole path in order from beginning to end as intended. Even if they accidentally stumble across a location later on that they weren't meant to visit yet, there's nothing to see there and nothing happens. Now, why use Bluetooth beacons instead of GPS? Well, GPS positioning requires line of sight to at least three satellites in the sky. It works great in open spaces, but if you're under trees or inside a building, underground or surrounded by tall structures, it doesn't work. Now these beacons use high frequency short range Bluetooth that doesn't require line of sight, so you can use them to lead players on a trail that goes pretty much anywhere. Now GPS would determine your location with an accuracy of around 5 to 10 meters. The transmission range of these beacons is also about 10 meters. So if you detect the ID being broadcast, you know you're within proximity of that beacon. But you can also measure the strength of the received signal as a way to increase that precision. As you move closer to the transmitter, the signal gets more powerful. And that strength is expressed in a value called RSSI, which you can access in your code as a way to guide players to a very specific location. So to demonstrate how to do that, and also show you a couple of other features I implemented, let me now show you the code that's running on the ESP32. 
At the top here I'm including quite a few libraries and these are all installed as part of the ESP32 Arduino core and they relate to different parts of Bluetooth functionality. These ones initialise the Bluetooth interface and allow you to perform a scan of nearby devices. Bluetooth beacons are described as advertising the services they have available and all the functionality I've demonstrated so far only requires us to listen to other nearby devices that are advertising themselves. But in this section here I'm also including some libraries to create a Bluetooth server on the ESP32 and enabling it to advertise itself. So why would you want to do that? Well. I used this project in a treasure hunt over the Easter weekend and obviously the idea is for teams to guide themselves around all the clues, but perhaps you need to have the ability for a games master to be able to override the state of the book, to reset progress or to skip over to the next clue. So as well as the ESP32 being a Bluetooth client that scans for the presence of beacons, these sections allow me to connect to the ESP32 from an app on my phone and remotely change the current clue being displayed. And I'll show you that in action in a bit. This is the library I'm using to control the e-paper display and the font for the text clues. And then this is the file containing all the images associated with each clue. So I created these by taking a photograph of each clue location, converting it into line art and then using this online tool to retrieve that image as a byte array. I've saved these into a separate header file just so that they don't clutter up the main code listing. Now I think the ability to add images makes this much more interesting than just having a text-based clue. They don't have to be photographs, you could add maps or rebus puzzles. The only thing to be aware of is ensuring you don't exceed the memory allocation on the ESP32. Now that varies a bit depending on exactly what board you're using, but most ESP32s have 4 megabytes of memory, and that needs to be shared between all these libraries, the program code itself, and the image data. Now I made a hunt with 10 clues, each one had a text clue in the top half of the screen and the image only being in the bottom half, so that's 200 by 300 pixel bitmap, and that was absolutely fine. Now this is the struct which defines how I store each clue. It needs to have the unique identifier associated with the beacon, the clue text, and then the height and width and the array of image data for the corresponding image. Now, there's several ways you could identify each beacon. Bluetooth beacons have something called a universally unique identifier, or UUID, and when I first started this project I thought, great, I'll use that. But when I loaded a Bluetooth scanner app on my phone, you can see that lots of the beacons actually shared the same UUID. It's not exactly as universally unique as you might think, so it's a bit pointless. Now you can log into each beacon and change that value, or you could also assign a name to the beacon, but I'm using the MAC address instead, which is a 6-byte array, and for the vast majority of cases should also be unique. Now that also means that I don't have to change any of the default values. Here I define the RSSI threshold value I mentioned earlier. So the closer you stand to the beacon, the higher the received signal strength becomes. Minus 90 is about the lowest value and 0 is the highest. Here I'm setting a threshold of minus 90, which basically means so long as the beacon is detected at all, it will be determined as found. And that's probably fine for an outdoor hunt. But if you're creating a hunt indoors or in a smaller area, you could increase this threshold value to make it closer to 0. And that means that players would need to be more precise in their positioning to activate the next clue. Now, here's another feature to mention. If you're making an epic hunt that lasts over several sessions, you might want players to be able to save their progress. This also helps if, for example, the battery dies halfway through and you need to swap it out for a fresh one. So I'm going to use the ESP32 preferences object to save the current clue index into non-volatile memory. And that will allow a team to go straight back to the clue they were up to, even if the book is turned off and on again. Now this callback here 
This is called when a Bluetooth characteristic is changed on the device. So this is the feature I mentioned about allowing a manual remote override of the current clue state. It retrieves the new value, assigns it to the current clue index, and also saves it to the preferences file. Now this is totally optional, but it's a useful extra management feature to have. Now the majority of the actual hunt mechanics are implemented in this callback. So this function is called every time a new Bluetooth beacon is detected. What we do is we get the MAC address of the beacon that's in range and we also retrieve its signal strength. If the signal strength exceeds the threshold we defined at the top of the code, then we compare the MAC address to the MAC address of the next clue we're looking for. And if they match, and also if the RSSI value is greater than the threshold, we have found the next clue location. What we do is just print a message, advance the clue index onto the next value, save our progress onto the preferences file, and then draw the next clue screen. So now we'll look at drawing the clue screen itself. We've actually got three functions related to drawing. This one here draws an image, and it is an image that is centered uh, horizontally and it's positioned at the bottom of the screen. So this matches the layout which I showed you in the video where the clue image appears in the bottom half of the screen and then the clue text appears in the top half. And I've got a helper function to draw the text here and this is a multi-line centered text. So in my clue text at the top of the screen, you'll notice that I included the new line character. This is not printed onto the screen. This is passed by the uh, text positioning function at the bottom there, and that positions it onto the next line down. So each of my clues has got four lines. And when printed using the font, which I've defined here, that fills the top half of the screen. And then the image fills the bottom half. So this just loops over all the lines of text, looks for that new line character, and if it finds it, moves down to the next Y value there. I've also got a function here to draw the start screen. So this is the kind of the splash or the title logo. And rather than only filling the bottom half of the screen and the text in the top, this is a full page display here. And then we get onto the setup function. So the setup function does a lot of routine actions here. We initialize a serial interface, although that's actually only used for debugging. We initialize the ePaper display, which uses an SPI interface. So I've defined the pins connected to the clock, the MISO, MOSI, and select lines here. These are all the default values on an ASP32 using the VSPI interface, but you can actually use any pins that you want and use the remapping feature of the ASP32, but I'm just using the default values here. We initialize the display, and I'm using it in portrait orientation because that matched the aesthetic of it being a book. But if you wanted to, you could display it in horizontal mode instead. I'll draw the splash screen, wait for 10 seconds, then display the first clue. Here we initialize the Bluetooth scanning. Here we initialize the Bluetooth advertisement of our own characteristic on this device. And then when we get to the loop function, there's basically nothing to do. Everything, all the functionality of the hunt itself is managed by these two callbacks that we looked at earlier. One, when we come into range of a new beacon. And this one, if we connect to the device and try to manually override it. Now, when it comes to the wiring for this project, that's thankfully very straightforward. As I mentioned, it's simply an SPI interface between the ESP32 and the display, along with some additional wires for reset, busy, and command lines. And this diagram and the table down here shows the GPIO pins in the code I used, but you can reassign these to other available pins if you'd like. Now, I'm using a 4.2 inch display, and the reason I chose ePaper specifically is not only because the aesthetic suited that of the book I was using, but because of its low power requirements and the fact that it's easy to read the display even in direct sunlight, which makes it perfect for a portable device that's going to be used outdoors. But if you wanted to, you could of course use a different type of display, such as an LCD or a TFT display if you preferred. So that's it. I hope this video has given you some ideas on how you can use ESP32s and BLE beacons to create location-based games such as treasure hunts. 
Now, as always, I'll upload the full code, the wiring diagram, and any other resources over to my Patreon account. So do please head over there if you'd like to download them or the materials related to any of the other projects I've made on this channel. I've got a Discord server where you can ask for help, share ideas for your own projects, and you can always leave comments here on YouTube as well, and I'll do my best to respond. Otherwise, I just want to say thank you very much for watching this far, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Okay, cheers. Bye.